Ah, uh, yeah, we're going to wade into the thick of it tonight. <laughs> this will be the official The Apostle P channel review of the Strider SNG. Stick with me, guys. We're going to talk about it. Hi gang, Rob here. It's the evening of 30 November 2013. And yes, tonight we do have a knife review, and it is indeed of the Strider SNG. And here it is, kind of a slow pan for you. This one wearing the flame anodized titanium frame side, and then this new tiger stripe pattern for strider the stonewashed blade with the blasted tiger stripes uh, no duracoat no cerakote just a little uh just a little blast and maybe a little acid i think what a cool effect and what a durable way to tiger stripe a blade and on the other side the g10 scale and integral backspacer are in an OD green. Really, really cool package. This particular offering, don't know if you can make out the Tang stamp, but it's in CPM S30V blade steel. And apparently, according to, I guess, <clears throat> to my hands and my touch while sharpening, one of the most positive things about this knife would be the way they heat treat their S30V. Um, well, hard to explain, just suffice it to say that <clears throat> the way it reacts to sharpening indicates to me that it's going to uh, hold up extremely well for S30V. Before we get into talking specifics and characteristics and specifications about this particular knife, I want to talk a little bit about where it comes from and who makes it. Um, a very little bit. <clears throat> There are uh, as many opinions about mixed strider and strider knives as there are knife experts and collectors and aficionados. Um, <laughs> let's just say that Mick Strider has created for himself and for his company, Strider Knives, a very effective reputation in the communities that buy his knives. <clears throat> How much of... Uh, how much of the marketing packet about Mick Strider is true, I'm going to leave, uh, leave to the ages to decide. Uh, we know it's not all true, and uh, we, know, <laughs> we know Mick's resume has been embellished. However, as we look at this knife, <clears throat> we are going to look at it from a perspective tonight that has absolutely nothing to do with the personality and the qualifications and accomplishments of uh, of its maker. We're just going to look at the knife. No hype. Uh, no bio. Just the knife. So what do we got? Let's look at some specifications first. We have a blade length and sort of a uh, Strider calls it a spear point. I would call it like a leaf shaped blade or a drop point. Three and a half inches long, as I said, of CPM S30V blade steel in this case. There are some others offered by Strider. That's what we have here, though. Stock is 160 thousandths or 4 millimeters thick. The handle length is 4.7 inches, giving us an overall length tip to tail of 8.2 inches. And then the weight. <clears throat> You know, for a sort of medium to large size tactical knife, given its materials and construction, is a very svelte 4.45 ounces. Um, that's pretty darn light for what's considered a hard-use knife. 
All those specs are pretty impressive and they make it a really nice medium sized tactical blade or sort of medium to large EDC blade. There is one spec I have left to give you though that has always kept me from purchasing this knife. Remember blade length three and a half inches but cutting edge a measly delica sized 2.8 inches. A full seven tenths of an inch of this blade length from where the handle ends to where the cutting edge begins is wasted <laughs> in a forward finger choiled followed by a hilt followed by a sharpening notch. I've never ever been able to wrap my mind around that. <clears throat> Why we have so much of this steel wasted on stuff that doesn't cut is beyond me. Just beyond me. Uh, I get forward finger choils. In fact, I kind of like them. Uh, I get sharpening notches. You've heard me bewail knives that don't have them. What I can't figure out is why Strider knives can't look at some other competitors' knives. Can you say hinderer? who combine the two features and start the cutting edge where the forward finger choil ends. It doesn't cut you, I promise, and we don't waste another almost half an inch of blade steel <clears throat> on nothing. Uh, I'm going to stop on that one now. It's just silly and ridiculous to me. Uh, except for one sort of important characteristic, the sharpening notch, is the interface for the closed stop on a strider. That sharpening notch actually comes to rest on a raised area of the spine of the G10. I don't think you're going to be able to see in there, maybe, but if you can see where my finger is poking in from the back, Immediately rearward of where you see my finger is a, an enlarged sort of bulbous round that contacts that sharpening notch. <coughs> Excuse me, that is your closed blade stop. Could they have skinned that cat another way? Yeah, they could have. Okay, enough about that. Now let's talk about some characteristics of this knife. Kind of the good stuff first. First of all, this nice oversized pivot. <clears throat> Very large. I think the head is 3 eighths of an inch and the pivot diameter itself is a little over a quarter. If I have my statistics right, that does give the knife a lot of stability. The pivot, of course, is surrounded by two even larger diameter phosphor bronze washers. <clears throat> However, if you sort of see the way the lock interface almost encroaches on the pivot area, um, we've got a pretty small mass of material in this area of the knife for what's billed as an extreme hard use knife. Frankly, there's just not a lot of support up here. The washers, um, <clears throat> although they have a large outside diameter, there's not much washer from where the OD of the pivot is to where the OD of the washer is, so there's not, not a great amount of added support from the Phosphor Browns washers. And does anybody but me see something that is a little alarming and maybe belies the reputation of strength that this knife has? Now, I'll grant you the head or the flange of that pivot is not as large as the through hole, uh, or it is larger than the through hole, but look at the thin section of material that's left here. Uh, a little bit thinner as the pivot goes through, but we got a pretty thin wall there. And even on the G10 side, not a lot of room between edge of the pivot and edge of the G10. And of course there is no liner on the G10 side, which is one way the knife achieves 4.45 ounce weight. <clears throat> uh, it, it, the SNG now is the little brother. We should mention that. The SMF is a longer knife, has a four inch blade, <clears throat> a little more meat in this area of the knife, 
And that is actually the military issue knife that has a national stock number and all that good stuff that gives Strider its uber military reputation. Um, what, <laughs> what I see here is not an extreme overbuilt hard use knife. Uh, what I see is a knife that looks really tough, but in reality, although it is a robust knife, uh, it's really more of a uh, kind of a working man's EDC knife. Uh, will it do some light prying when called upon? You bet it will. I mean, look at the blade stock. Uh, probably wouldn't want to grab it way back here to do that prying because I think it has a pretty weak frame area. Will the blade take it? Yeah, you bet it will. Especially if you stay up on the spine and stay away from the tip. Uh, but we don't have, you know, <laughs> we don't have a superhuman war machine of a knife here, I don't think. Certainly, uh, and granted, it's much lighter, but you know, it's it's no bench made of Thomas, not by a long shot. Uh, and you know. <laughs> Here's another thing I want to talk about. I'm going to get all the negative out of the way before I get to what's really cool about this knife. Um, it's a $400 knife. And it competes in really what is some pretty stiff competition. Let's face it, the, the two main competitors in the knife world for the Strider SNG are the Hinderer XM18 and the Chris Reeve Sabenza. <clears throat> now you can make the case that the Sabenza might be less of a tactical knife. Uh, it looks like more of a gentleman's folder. But frankly, it gives up nothing in strength. In fact, it might be a little stronger knife than, than the SMG. Um, the Hinderer, of course, <clears throat> although sells for a little less than this knife, if you can get one brand new from Hinderer, uh, in the secondary markets, it'll do twice as much as a Strider. And there's a reason it does twice as much as a Strider, because it's a lot better knife than a Strider. Uh, it just is. And the one area that the Strider really is exposed as the lesser or the least of those three is in its lock. They're all three titanium liner locks, or titanium frame locks, excuse me. Um, the Sabenza being the first, in fact, it's called the integral lock, the Chris Reeve integral lock, uh, popularized <clears throat> when other companies started to copy it as the frame lock. And this is sort of one of those situations where the original is the best. I'm not talking about ultimate strength. Um, nobody's ever going to do anything to break this lock bar in any of the three knives. What I'm talking about is refinement. Um, operation that gives you an air of confidence about the knife and something that feels good when you use it. Uh, and there are some some of those areas where the SNG just doesn't cut it, not for a $400 knife. First of all, <clears throat> depending on how you open it, what the temperature and humidity are on a given day, how much, if you're opening this with your right hand, how much pressure you're putting on the lock bar as you open it, you're going to have varying degrees of lock stick. Did you hear that? Um, now, if I open this left-handed and barely let the lock engage, am I less than 50% there? Yeah. And when I go to close it, just the tiniest bit of stick. If I open this with my right hand, and, you know, let's say I'm fighting the detent a little bit. Now I've got engagement a little over 50% and a lot of stick. Sometimes enough stick that you really struggle to get the, the lock unlocked. <clears throat> and by the way, we're running a little Sharpie to minimize that. There's something else I want to show you. I'm going to open this so I get some stick. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull back against the stop pin on the spine of this blade. I want you to listen. Get this close to the microphone. Did you hear that? Do this again. 
Again, lots of stick. Listen, I'm going to pull back on the blade. There's so much flex in the mechanism of this knife uh, that I can stick that lock in there deep. It should. This should be under a lot of tension, right? But all I do is pull back on the blade and that lock pops, snaps. Now I got no stick at all, hardly. Um, that's troubling for a couple reasons. First of all, that tells me that this mechanism isn't that strong. If, if I have opened that knife so that blade is jammed against that stop pin hard and my lock is engaged so far that I've developed a significant amount of stick, I shouldn't be able to grab hold of it and pull it further back and listen to the lock breaking free going back to the open position. Uh, first of all, that means the knife isn't really that strong. And second of all, it means the full extension for this lock bar, the way it's adjusted on this particular knife, uh, is basically right to the point of engagement. There's no, there's no real spring tension uh, bearing on that, uh, on that lock interface on the blade tang. Contrast that with a, a Sebenza. If you take the blade out of a, Seven, out of a Sebenza with the knife put together, the lock bar will dive all the way to the opposite scale. You know, the, the lock geometry, the way they carburize their locks, the way the lock face is, is finished, the way the blade tang is finished, uh, Chris Reeve has that down to a science. So they can, they can make a lock bar with a whole bunch of tension on it, and it never develops what I would call terminal lock stick. Um, it buries into that blade tang with a lot of pressure, but the titanium never really deforms. The lock never gets more sticky than just what you need to be confident in it. It's almost like a hydraulic stick. Uh, it's the same every time. It never gets worse. It just it, There's just a way a Chris Reeve lock feels that is so much more confidence-inspiring and one that feels like a higher quality piece than the, than the SNG. The hinderer is better too, <clears throat> but in a much different way. The hinderer uses pretty light lock bar pressure, um, but you never get any stick. The, the lock can't be forced in if you're you know, bearing down on the knife with some pressure. And here's another thing for you to listen to. Just in a regular hammer grip with the right hand, if I'm bearing down on the knife and I squeeze, listen. That creaking sound is the lock bar. Um, just kind of not well finished and a little flimsy in the lock area. It doesn't make it a bad knife, but uh, compared to the hinderer, let's finish that discussion. Um, the hinder is just, uh, it's silky smooth. It doesn't, doesn't have an inordinate amount of tension on the lock bar, uh, but it snaps home with authority. Never a hint of lock stick. I mean, you can't even hardly make that knife stick if you try. And it just feels completely polished. Uh, not so here. Okay, enough beating up on the Strider lockup. Uh, first, let's talk about deployment. And by the way, finish about the mechanism. The thumb studs are really not thumb studs, sort of they're thumb studs, but they're really much like the hinderer. They are blade stops in the open position. And not the most ergonomic deployment uh, via thumb stud. The hole works better. Just a little more comfortable once you get to know the knife. Now, if you are like I am and sort of a Strider fan, this oval hole... Um, <laughs> I know it's different, but it's just not as good. Uh, the thumb doesn't, it just doesn't sit in it with as much confidence and authority, uh, especially if you're doing the sort of flick with the middle finger. It's just, it's very hard to be sure you're in there right. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, it works the best with that sort of full range deployment where you bury your thumb in the hole and take it all the way to the stop. And it's not slow, guys doing that. 
I love the way the knife closes, um, even off-handed. I'm, I'm not going to use the correct hand, the right hand, because this cut's still bothering me. Um, <clears throat> but my left hand's pretty good at using uh, frame locks backwards anyway, since I'm a lefty. But just look, look at the slickness with which that thing closes. Don't have to reposition your hand. Don't have to take two swipes at it. It just goes closed. That's very nice for me. Uh, <clears throat> ergonomics. If I'm if I'm back in the main choil, uh, it feels like I've got sort of a pistol grip. If I if I'm grabbing it in a saber grip, the, this angle back here buries so nicely into the hand. I've got jumping back on the butt. I've got jumping for my thumb. That's great. If I'm doing some fine work, I come up into this forward shoil, I can index my thumb to the jimping or come even far forward. Uh, the knife feels great in hand in that grip. Uh, if I go hammer grip, it feels better in the more rearward shoil, a lot better. And if I go for a pull stroke, that's pretty darn comfortable. Really comfortable. And how is it reverse? Uh, it's money. Really well thought out. Much more ergonomic knife than appearances would lead you to believe. <clears throat> and I want to back up a little bit. Remember, we got a 4.4 ounce knife. Uh, another ounce, one uh, other 1.3 ounces gets you to Sabenza, and the hinderer is what about two? I'm sorry, a Sebenza is three tenths of an ounce heavier than this knife, and a Hinderer is about 1.2 ounces heavier in the three and a half inch length XM18. So this is the lightweight of the bunch. Um, let's not expect it. Well, let's not expect it to live up to its marketing data. Um, it is a pretty strong knife for its construction and its weight. It's just not. Uh, well, it's not a fixed blade, and it's not even the, it's not the strongest folding tactical knife of its size. Um, and it's got limitations in its lock and pivot. Let's talk about fit and finish a little bit. And there again, uh, Strider does not, uh, does not portray itself to be uh, a company that makes knives at a high level of fit and finish in their production line. <clears throat> in fact, let's take a look at a, maybe the best example uh, where the titanium frame meets the integral G10 backspacer and offside scale. You know, there's a, a pretty good little apparent offset in that butt jimping. Um, obviously, these two pieces aren't finished put together. Those grooves aren't cut with the two pieces put together. There, there's some variation there. Um, and that's, I guess, maybe the worst example. It's the, in other areas, this knife just doesn't put itself in a position to be scrutinized like that. <clears throat> this jumping up here, uh, there's a lot of room for error because it's just not supposed to match up. They're, the shapes aren't even the same. Uh, good thinking. Uh, not, not so much back here. It just doesn't give you the uh, it doesn't give you the appearance that it was really designed to be very precise, and it's really not. One thing about it though, it's fun to play with, even with a sticky lock, which isn't really sticky all the time, um, and you know, the difficult to get to use deployment hole. It makes you want to get better. You know, it makes you want to play with it and get better at these moves. Oh, one thing it's really good at is these drops. I mean, it loves that. that spidey drop. It actually does a spidey drop better than a spidey because the round or the oval hole doesn't want to twist, pivot in your pinch grip like a spider co does. Good job, Strider. <clears throat> it's kind of a neat knife to carry. I really, 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 really wish they made one left-handed. Um, I don't necessarily mind the way it carries in my left pocket like this. 
uh, here's why I wear like khakis most of the time. And if you think about it, if this is in the left pocket, the top of that pocket kind of cuts like this. So not so much of the knife sticks out. Now, in the right pocket, it's just the opposite. That pocket would cut like that and leave all this knife sticking up. If you have jeans, it's not so much of a problem because it's kind of square or, you know, straight across. But it actually looks better in the left pocket. The only problem is drawing it from the left pocket is I have to pull it out and then turn it 180 degrees to deploy it. I don't mind that. Um, <clears throat> ah, you know, that's okay. I will tell you that someday I'll find a deal on one of these that I want, and I'll have one. Um, this knife, as you're probably aware by now, is not mine. This is one of the two, along with the Hinder XM18, that my good friend John One All's Pub sent me to evaluate and review and this is going to go back to him on Monday this being a Saturday night I've had him long enough and I'm sure he misses them terribly and he's kind of like uh, kind of like I am with this knife John is a Sabenza owner he is a multiple and many times over hinderer owner in fact kind of an expert on hinderers <laughs> he hates it when I say that um, the last of the three for him to purchase has been the Strider. And he, he recognizes, I think, some of the same differences that I do in the three and why this is his least favorite of the three also. Still likes it, as do I. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I, had, if I had a hinderer lottery ticket in my hand and got, and got called, or I had a, a $410 for a Sabenza or $400 for a Strider like this one, this would be the last one I would buy. Um, and I don't mean to say that it's... I don't mean to say this knife is all hype and no function. It's just not so. Uh, I think it would be an absolutely awesome $250 knife. You know, if this knife were... Uh, if this knife had a round hole in it and it said... Golden Colorado, USA Earth, or Taichung, Taiwan, <clears throat> and it was 250 bucks. you betcha I would own one. But 400 um, for for a mechanism that I really would equate to a $200 ZT, uh, you know, sort of the same inherent issues, uh, lock faces that round off, get sticky, develop slip or play or lock rock. You know, all the, the problems in the Strider lock are well documented. Uh, frankly, I'd rather have this kind of sticky one than one that rocks or slips. Um, I can deal with sticky. I can't deal with sloppy. Here's another thing. Cool noises. Doesn't it make cool noises? I love that sound it makes when you close it. You wouldn't think you'd get that nice sort of ringing bong sound when you uh, hit that G10 backspacer, but it, it's cool. You know, great fondling knife. Great little utility knife. Just not $400 great. And I know I'm probably sort of a lone voice in the wilderness on that one. Um, but I got to tell you what I really think after I look at something objectively. Look at that edge, though, by the way. Yeah. In exchange for my uh, week of fondling, this had its factory edge on it when John sent it to me. So I asked him if he'd like me to put one of mine on it, and he said absolutely. So I did, and it's pretty darn sharp. I don't have any super flimsy paper, just this kind of piece of recycled kid's notebook paper. Came out pretty nice though. It'll work. Well guys, that's about all I have. And I, I really hope this review doesn't strike you as being super negative. I think it, uh, the knife might be better than some of the time I spent on its negative characteristics. I do like it, and I'll probably have one someday. And I really, really appreciate you, John, for letting me 
spend some time with yours. That's all for tonight, my friends. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and Heidi's Christmas candle hiding out in the background. Thank you very much, Snowman. Hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and remember the word and one of those pubs SNG are sharp.